Greetings and welcome to Candler Worship. We are grateful to have you join us today for this virtual service. Today we have the pleasure of welcoming a new friend of Candler as our preacher, the Right Reverend Andrew Doyle, who is the ninth Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Texas. He is most noted for his ministry focus on service, evangelism, and reconciliation. We are excited to have Bishop Doyle with us in this service and look forward to hearing from him soon. Now friends, as we enter into this time of worship, we recognize that this is a very busy season. So we pray that in this time of worship, you take a moment to just slow down and join your Candler community in praise of God and take a moment to breathe. And now let us worship our God together in spirit and in truth. Now that you are here in a space dedicated to the Most High, pause and consider where your faith and hope are really fixed. Do not put your trust in politicians, not in any guru who is a human creature like you. The breath of every human being will cease. On that day, all their mortal aspirations expire. God's realm will last forever beyond all generations till earth and moon and stars are no more. I will praise you alone, Lord of my soul. I will praise you as long as I live. I will sing to you as long as my soul has being. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. As he taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces 
and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came in and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Did me.
Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The widow makes an offering of her whole life, uh, her whole being, her whole living, is how we might uh, translate our gospel uh, today. When the widow makes her offering, she undertakes a bodily act. Her body's inner pain and scars of misfortune, financial ruin and injustice are all brought forward with the two uh, copper coins. Her corporality is visible and her presence highlights injustice. Two coins and her body testify to her discrimination as a labeled widow. It's true that the search for truth must be willing to hear the voice of suffering, uh, something that Cornell West often says. But sometimes those voices are silent and all that is left is presence in the face of such injustice. The widow's body bears just such a witness, bringing the words of uh, theologian Rowan Williams into the conversation about this parable, we might say the widow's body reveals the dimension of unseen relations and connections in and between all things and their source in God, that intimate uh, and dynamic relationship uh, evoked by the Greek uh, theologians. To see her is to see her body as co-figuring the body of Christ, a very embodied logos, uh, a logos that preempts accepted social cues codified by the powers that be. The widow in this liturgy of offering returns our eyes and minds to her parentological state, that her being that she possesses that exists prior to the labeling, objectification, and codification of her as widow, woman, mother, what have you. Holding the parable this way, we're able to consider the widow as not raised and liberated by her own action or offering or by Christ's parable pointing out the obvious. No, instead the widow is to be seen as imago Dei, the image of God by her very bodily existence. Her actuality places a claim upon the divine's image. Here is Scandalon and Moria, right? The, the scandal and foolishness of the gospel. Theologian James Cone suggested that at the heart of this, this theological concept of the image of God is a, a fellowship of human liberation. Such a notion breaks the parable open again, and we may hope to accept the widow as expositing, if you will, the meaning of God's liberation as she reflects Christ's own offering. God's claim upon her as one of the people of God, an image of God at once individual, corporate, and transcendent, reminds us she is an inheritance of the freedom of Egypt. Cohn might say, here is where theology begins. Her bodily presence, her holding the two coins, her letting go, the, the widow's bodily momentum emerge as an unbinding liberation from the fine-robed powers over her. Her bodily act broadcasts her birthright in God's liberating kingdom. She is one of God's kingdom, God's people. God's kin. Here is the mystery of personhood, not the personhood of a widow, a woman, or mother, but the, cor the, but the corrupted image of God by uh, uh, physically abused by corrupt economic system and powers which use the power to name as a power to uh, commoditize what little the widow has. This is a, a parabolic relationship to the victim's body the widow's body, her 
bodily presence with Christ's body, eternally in parallel uh, in cosmic time. Uh, note the passage of prophecy uh, uh, regarding Jesus' own persecution and crucifixion and punishment uh, that comes in the very next chapter. Liberation begins with her sacrifice uh, uh, pressed upon her, yet offered freely. A bodily counterpart to Jesus' own suffering of his flesh and sorrows and body for the world. In this, there is reconfigured a positive frame from which to begin, where blackness, brownness, deafness, blindness, orphan, widow, no longer are prefigured or disfigured as deficient by some fraudulent normative frame. Instead, the widow's bodily presence dispels the false faith in human constructions of society. By making her bodily offering, uh, she overturns oppressive narratives about who she is uh, from those outside of God's vision. We are given the same opportunity to sacrifice our living by embodying our birthright, the image of Christ, instead of placing our trust in the outer accoutrement of religion. The challenge goes still further, inviting us to image Jesus' own example in offering this parable and narrative. So to discover, if you will, such persons in similar situations and recognize the image of God in them, and thus finding a means to highlight their plight as a Christ figure in our midst. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us pray. Merciful God of compassion and justice, hear us and have mercy upon us as we confess our sins. We are not the stewards Christ calls us to be. Riches possesses us while others go hungry. We mismanage creation with our pollution and strife to obtain even more than we already have. We abuse your provision for us by our selfish desires. Help us hear again Christ's call to be faithful. And through him, forgive us as we repent of our sins and turn from it. Lord, hear our prayer. Loving God, the widow of Zarephath, with a handful of flour and a drop of oil, fed the prophet Elijah before her child and herself. God, teach us the joy of hospitality, which welcomes friend and stranger, neighbor and enemy, and so finds you feasting among us. Lord, hear our prayer. God of abundance, the widow of Jerusalem, with two small coins offered to you her love, her worship, and all she had. Teach us the joy of giving freely, which counts nothing as ours by right, but willingly shares and so finds you sharing among us. Lord, Hear our prayer. God of resurrection, Christ Jesus with his whole being sacrificed himself for the sake of your love for us. Teach us the joy of giving ourselves to you so that we yearn for your presence, long for your salvation, and so find you living among us. Lord, hear our prayer. God of mercy, it is ever your will that we love and work and pray for those who are in need of bread and of shelter, of healing and of wholeness. Hear the prayers we make for those of our world those of our community, and those of our family who are in need. We lift before you now in the silence of our hearts and with the words of our lips. Lord, hear our prayer. Bless, we pray, O God, your church throughout the world and help it to fulfill the purpose you have given it. Especially we pray for our own congregation. Guide us each day and help us to give as completely as we have received. We ask it in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, our brother and friend. Amen.
Thank you for worshiping with us. We pray that you carry pieces of this service with you throughout the rest of your day. And now receive the benediction. May you be continuously perfected by the Holy Spirit and of good courage. May you be of one mind with Christ and live in peace. And may the God of love be with you always. Now unto that God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or imagine. To that God be glory and honor, dominion and power, both now and forever. Beloved, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.